really, really fascinating right now for a variety of reasons. Here's here's my argument. Unless you are in Bill Self or John Shire's chair, there are no guarantees. So here's what I mean by that. Because you're out there saying, wait a minute, what about Dan Hurley? I'm going to get to him in a second. Bill Self is constant. It's a machine. It's it's a it's a machine. They're they're able to get who they want. You know, people are, want to play for them, and Bill Self can go and and even get guys that sometimes don't fit. Remember Bill Self at the press conference this past year at the end of the season. He goes, "I've been planning for next year for the last month." He saw the writing on the wall. He saw he wasn't going to make the Final Four. Bill mm-hmm. Self's bored now in the NCAA tournament. Like he is, he expects to be in the first and second round. He wants to make the Final Four. John Shire is going to be able to, he has everything at his disposal. And ha, and to his credit, has done an elite job at recruiting. And it's beyond Cooper Flag, uh, this upcoming year's class, you know, uh, between Kama Malawach and Khan Kanupal, who I think is going to be a, a stud for them. And, you know, the, the list goes on and on with, with Harris, who I think is going to be a, a special talent for them. Here's my point, guys. There are ripple effects to Cal leaving Kentucky. And going to Arkansas. One, Arkansas with Cal, fascinating player in this scene. You know, he's he's trying to convince kids to come along with him. Wait a minute, I thought I was going to be playing for the UK brand. So mm-hmm. now Mark Pope comes in, injects a whole new energy there. Louisville hasn't been much of a player in recent years. If they've been a player, they haven't been getting results. Now Pat Kelsey gives that program a new dimension. Where does Dan Hurley fall in this? Dan Hurley looks for a certain fit. He doesn't take anybody. He doesn't take everybody. He's on top of the world, but he has gotten mentored by Jay Wright on there's a balance between taking the biggest talent versus taking who fits what you want, who fits who you are as a program. Hence, you know, why why when you're looking at the – UConn doesn't just hand out offers. When these kids say, I got offered by UConn, it means Connecticut is, is genuinely interested in that. So the my my point in essence is we are in a fascinating time in the recruiting landscape and it was shown in Peach Jam because because of the amount of movie pieces and parts there are in college basketball for these kids they have the leverage and they have big pockets. And in this landscape why would you commit early? Why why do it if you can continue to see how things are are going to evolve in your recruitment? Yeah, the the smart coaches will I do think that there's going to be a pretty big change here coming up in terms of uh how often you see guys getting some of these fifth and sixth year transfers, right? Like the COVID year is gone. Um you're not going to be able to have these these players that have done 5 years with, with a redshirt year at a mid-major transfer up as a 24-year-old and come start for your program, right? That's right. just not going to be something that that happens in college basketball anymore cuz the COVID year is gone. Now uh, my hot take is I would love to actually see that stick around. Like, if he's, I know Teal is going to laugh at me when I say that, but I wouldn't mind seeing that. I do think that smart coaches are going to find a way to be able to um, tap into these freshmen. And it was actually, I had an interesting conversation with one guy that was basically saying, like, he's going to use the end of his roster when it comes to filling all of those 15 scholarships or whatever it ends up being with guys that are one, cheaper in terms of NIL valuations and two players that you're just kind of rolling the dice on. You bring them in for a year. You have them kind of operate in the role of a a walk on where they're more of a practice player than anything else. And you just see who can kind of break through. You see which of these freshmen can maybe have a chance. They're really picking up on what you're doing. They are thriving playing against the first team and they end up getting minutes towards the end of the year. Um, and you can find a way to be able to say like, all right, we got a seven man freshman class coming in here. There are two that we really wanted five that we're taking a flyer on. We're going to set, we're going to run four of them off, but this one kid proved that he can find a way to develop into our program. We're going to keep him around. So I think one, we're going to see a lot of that. One more point, you know, if you can, there's still something to be said about aggressively recruiting and, and getting kids that fit your identity and, and a kid just loves what you're putting down. Like, I look at a Kim English, how he's recruiting for 2025, and he got Jameer Jones, Mm -hmm. who I saw last week. And, you know, that's a huge gift for Providence and a great gift for him because he plays the right way. He's six foot six. He's long. He defends. He can fly above the rim. And they've got 
Jalen Harrell as well, another top 100 guy. Good, like yeah. th this, th that recruiting class is taking shape. That that's a program to that's not at Duke, UConn, Kentucky brand. But I think Terrence, it's interesting, right? In this landscape of you if you're a coach like a Kim English where he's at, or you know, put in your ACC program, right? Like a like a, a I'm just throw out there like a Wake Forest, right? Or even a, even a Clemson. Like when you're not at the level of the blue blood, and you've got money that you're allocating, do you sometimes say, "Man, I damn, I love this kid." And I, I know the other big, big whales are going to potentially want him. Maybe I can get him a little earlier if I do this, if I take the earlier shot. That's what I'm intrigued by. Yeah. And I think what you're seeing in places like that, I'm not sure how many scholarships. Well, Providence is doing just that. They took the Oswin kid who was like a high four-star, five-star kid, and they right. took him a year early, paid him a little bit, and like, we hope this is going to pan out. We need to hang on to him. I Wait think for the home run. Exactly. And then another thing, too, instead of taking three and four guys per year, like people are only taking two. And I like when it comes to freshmen, because there's no point in oversaturating what you're doing anyway. I, I we talk about these scholarships going 15 kids. I think you're still going to see a little bit of a prevalence of a walk on spot just every now and then. It's just you're going to be able to scholarship them. And you're going to be able to just keep them around for a while. You're not going to give them any money, but you'll be able to scholarship them. And that's huge for a lot of these kids. And throw in the fact this is, this is happening. Room. I'm sorry. Huge for them and good for your locker room. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. You're going to keep some guys like that every now and then. I think that's great. And it comes back to there was a five star kid that was playing corner. Florida didn't have any scholarships left. So the guy says he's going to walk on at Florida, but they're going to pay him a million dollars or something. Right. So it's, it's like it, that only makes sense. So they're basically going roster caps instead of scholarship allotments, which guys I'm, I'm okay with. Like I, I'm okay with that. Now, even the guys that don't play, they're going to get their scholarships taken care of too. And not all the time. It depends on how you go about it. And I, and I can see the, how Rob would do it. I understand that, but it also like the, the, the guys at the end of the bench that work their nuts off every day in practice and stuff like that. Like yeah. in case you just want to have 13 and two guys that you just take. Because they're character guys. So I, I could see it being like 11 and then four guys that you just take. And I think a lot of them, you know, there's there's a lot of the, there's this kind of misconception that walk ons are just like whatever. You're pulling somebody out. No, of the house. Like, a good play. A lot of the, times the wa a lot of those walk ons could go play the D3 level and be able to to be really good. There's a lot of walk ons that take walk on positions at high majors instead of getting scholarships at low majors. Right. Like these are there are really good players that end up in those positions. And I think a lot of them now are just going to have their scholarships played for. I do think what's interesting is fancy. You mentioned Providence. Um, we haven't really talked much about BYU and what's happening at BYU on, uh, on, on the DTF pod yet. But uh, I think you see it in some of these SEC traditional SEC football markets, like in Ole Miss and Chris Beard, like Arkansas, right? These places where you have a localized rabid fan base where the university is the single most important thing. Like to me, that is the next tier of the blue bloods. And I think that BYU is the perfect example. One national fan base that also happens to be very, very prevalent in Salt Lake city and in the state of Utah Two, it's a city and a state that has a whole bunch of money. Like when at Silicon Valley, as those prices went through the roof, you know, a lot of those companies ended up opening up uh, offices during COVID in those mountain towns, right? in those kind of Rocky Mountain, Boise, Salt Lake, Missoula, places like that, right? And I think that what we're seeing now is uh, those BYU boosters that care a lot about the success of BYU are starting to pour money into that program, which is why, I mean, you look at the list for A.J. DeBonta, the number one recruit in the country, Fanta, and uh, the teams that you – he doesn't have a list, but the teams that you hear most are like Alabama, BYU. Auburn, Arkansas, USC, and BYU is getting thrown right. into that mix as well. Like, don't be surprised if those programs, Providence kind of fits that bill as well. Like, where you have that really, really rabid, passionate, localized fan base that will put money into the program. I think we're going to see that a lot more.